Welcome back to the Rich Fritzky Show. It's been a while as we take this semi-summer hiatus, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be doing this. Congratulations to the 11 cities that just recently announced that they have joined hands to introduce mechanisms to pay reparations to those whose ancestors were enslaved. Each has formed a municipal commission to do the analysis, forge a plan, and begin. Included are Providence, Rhode Island, Asheville and Durham, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, Tallahassee, Oklahoma, Kansas City, Missouri, Los Angeles and Sacramento, California, St. Paul, Minnesota, Denver, Colorado. Tellingly, that's five blue states and four red states. Stockton and San Francisco, California, and even Asheville were already on board. They suffer from no pretense as to their ability to cure this endemic injustice, but they believe and in fact know that they can certainly at least get the ball rolling and demonstrate to their respective states and to those in the hallowed halls of the United States Capitol and the White House that it is a reason and tangible mechanism to begin the effort to close the abhorrent wage and wealth gap that separates the average African-American family and individual from both their white counterparts and others. Each of them will shine a little light and send forth the word that it is never too late to bow one's head and seek forgiveness for one's sins. Even a token is a beginning, a first step to compensate a people for a loss so great as to encompass up to 250 years of bondage. Our beleaguered nation also might, beyond direct payments, look to programmatic initiatives focused upon housing, health care, nutrition, education, like Head Start, after-school care, literacy, college tuition credits, career training initiatives, and more. It will no doubt meet with the kind of heartless resistance that such great effort and advances typically do, and yet it sure begs the question as to why. For the truth is that Abraham Lincoln lives so large in our historical memory not because he simply won the war and saved the United States of America alone, but more importantly because he ended slavery, resurrected and rewrote a hypocritical declaration of independence, and began to finally truly render America a land of freedom and liberty where all ought to be upheld in the race of life. Yet more than 100 years of Jim Crow followed, another cruel form of slavery, where rights were freely denied and where sociological equanimity never even began to take hold. The civil rights movement of the 1960s did crack the armor of institutional racism i.e. the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, Model Cities, Offices of Economic Opportunity, Affirmative Action, and the like. Medgar Evers, James Baldwin, Malcolm X, Martin, and their brethren pushed the paradigm forward. But they were killed, and momentum slowed. And in the 53 years since Martin gave his impossibly empowering and prophetic mountaintop speech on the night before he was assassinated, there's been no advance whatsoever in economic empowerment, and the wealth gap remains just as brutally intolerable. His promise that they would one day ascend there together in victory is nowhere in sight. So why not move on reparations? Why not a helping hand to address grave and systemic injustice? Why not be innovative? Oh, sure, we may have stopped using the Christian cross to lynch those who made the awful mistake of looking at a white woman, but the slave ship has never stopped sailing in our land of the free and home of the brave. For yes, all the change, all the brag and bravado and claims to the contrary White racism has stoically prevailed. The 216 to 300 plus some odd bills that have only recently been adopted by red legislatures across the country this year 
aimed at dumbing down and politicizing voting rights and doing everything possible to keep people from exercising their sacred franchise. Bear witness to just how deep it cuts, how deep it runs, in the name of an imaginary fraud, an absolutely false narrative, balderdash, blunderbust, and pure, unadulterated horseshit. They do this. We ever so sadly remain a nation that wants to run away from the darkness of our truth. Need I even mention all the anti the teaching of, quote, critical race theory, unquote, in our schools? What is nothing more than a fearsome term, a made-up term for teaching the slave's story, for teaching the history of racism in our America? After all, in the name of burying the darkness, and why can't we all just get along, why teach all this negative bad stuff now, as if that's no longer who we are? Fact check, that's just exactly who we are. Once upon a time, America had a brain and a heart also, or so I believed, or so I have always wanted to believe. For we have grown cold, stoic, isolate, for what movement on race that there is today is predominantly focused upon a negative, focused upon a you-must-stop-killing-us agenda, a police reform agenda, a sever the stain and sin of racism from those who serve and protect. Can you imagine anything more simple or worthy or obvious than that and still everywhere? There is pushback, obfuscation, excuses, silence, as they wait for the Fuhrer to give way to the oh-so-familiar indifference. I was a boy, a teenager pretending to be a man when I first heard Peter, Paul, and Mary's Take Your Place on the Great Mandela, as it moves through your sweet moment of time. Yes, win or lose now, you must choose now. And if you do, you're only losing your life. Fifty-five years later, it is the great Mandela still, where we take our stands, sing our songs, argue our arguments, pray and bleed, only to fall and lose. And if we lose, we're only losing our life. And then in the refrain, this gut punch, and it's been going on for 10,000 years. And still we hope, carrying that hope as best we can until we die. At 71 now, I know that what I believe to be in the immediate offing in my teens in the 60s has yet to be realized. That's yet. And it's on you. It's on all of us. The short story version as to why the movement stalled is that beyond taking out their leaders, Bobby Kennedy, who would most certainly have advanced this cause as president and who would have won, was killed. And Richard Milhouse Nixon won in 1968, ushering in the great war on crime, which would morph into the great war on drugs which drove the agendas of presidents of both parties for the next 40 years, culminating with the notorious Clinton crime bill with its mandatory minimums. The only advance for black Americans there was simply to assure that many more of them would get to beef up the vastly ascending prison populations. A most telling statistic, by the way, low-level drug crimes. Black Americans were six times more likely to go to both trial and jail for the exact same charges as white Americans. Six times. And they argue that there is no systemic racism. Good God above, there is no greater stain upon the soul of America than its putrid stench. To positively close this segment, let me turn to Bobby and his famous Cape Town, South Africa address. Back in 1965, when apartheid was still in vogue there, 
he movingly said, the cruelties and obstacles of this swiftly changing planet will not yield to obsolete dogmas and outworn slogans. It cannot be moved by those who cling to a present which is already dying, who prefer the illusion of security to the excitement and danger which comes with even the most peaceful progress. Calling all to action, he concluded, it is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Believe that. Believe that still. Insist on justice and insist on teaching the damn truth and letting history be history and fight any attempt anywhere to preclude voting or to politicize voting. Today, only one force stands in the way of the 200 plus anti-voting right bills. And that's the For the People Act on the table in the United States Senate as I speak, which will give the federal government and not the states control of federal elections and bar the door to meaningless and absurd voter suppression. It will require vanquishing the filibuster and bringing every Democrat on board. Insist on it insist on it. And three cheers for 11 great American cities who are putting themselves on the firing line in order to change in appalling inequity. Please teach us all how to live. 71 now and still at it, still fired up, still believing in the better angels of our nature, in you, in the ultimate goodness of people. For the people are bust now, now, now. We can, we must, we will, we have to. That's a wrap for today, folks. I'll be back in a few weeks. As ever, those who care to listen, I thank you for doing so. Take care. Have a great summer. Keep on smiling on your brothers and sisters out there. Bye.